If you have not turned your phones off, if you could help us with that, we would greatly appreciate that. And we will dismiss all the little guys eight and under at this moment. If you have your Bibles, turn to Deuteronomy 33 this morning. And if you have a piece of paper or a little bookmark, you might want to put it there because we're, you know, don't don't feel bad if you can't follow along. We're going to look at several verses uh, along the way. Maybe you can look at the, the person next to you or whatever, or maybe you just want to sit and listen as we go through. But we're going to look at several verses along the way this morning. We're going to talk about the blessing of Zebulun and Issachar. You know, Bible names are funny in the sense that we get used to growing up hearing them pronounced a certain way. And some of the Bible names, we actually say them wrong. All my life, I've called it Zebulun. But the actual pronunciation is Zebulun. And there's a bunch of names like that. So, you know, if I flip back and forth, you'll you'll understand. I'm just having a few of my, my moments here. And uh, so, um, but we're going to talk about the blessing of Zebulun and Issachar. Uh, look at, again, Deuteronomy 33, verse 1. This is the springboard for this whole passage. And it says, And this is the blessing wherewith Moses, the man of God, blessed the children of Israel before his death. And this blessing was prophetic. It was about blessings that would yet come on their generations and even to the end of time. And uh, so we've been moving through this passage. And right now we're at verse 18. And uh, in Deuteronomy 33, verse 18, and it says, And of Zebulun, he said, Rejoice, Zebulun, in thy going out, and Issachar in thy tents. They shall call the people into the mountain. There they shall offer the sacrifices of righteousness, for they shall suck of the abundance of the seas and of treasures hid in the sand. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord. We pray that you would help us, Lord. It's been a joy already to be here. It's been a joy to sing the songs and, um, and Lord, just to hear, Lord, uh, again this morning, our hope is in the Lord and, and God, there's not a friend like the lowly Jesus and Lord, just some of these things we've sang this morning and God, I pray that already the reality of that Lord would be on us and Lord, we carry it home with us today. God, truly you are our friend and God, you want to be our friend. Uh, Lord, there may be some here that, Lord, they they haven't entered into that friendship with you this morning. They don't really know you this morning. God, in Jesus' name, we pray, Lord, that once again, you would make yourself attractive. Lord, you are attractive, but Lord, they must see it, Lord. They must recognize, Lord, that you are everything that you claim to be. Lord, would you let that dawn? And Lord, even the rest of us, Lord, that we we know this, and yet, Lord, may we see your beauty again this morning. God, may we love you more, and uh, God, may we enter in, Lord, in, in some small way, and we pray, Lord, even a big way, into the blessing, Lord, this morning, in Jesus' name, amen. Verse 18, and of Zebulun, he said, rejoice, Zebulun, in thy going out, and Issachar, in thy tents. They shall call the people into the mountain, there they shall offer sacrifices of righteousness. You know, Zebulun and Issachar were the only ones in this whole list that were told to rejoice. And that's really amazing. All these blessings of these tribes, as we move down through the list, uh, they were truly blessings and they were big blessings. We looked last week at the blessing of Joseph on how God took five verses to just be very specific about all the great things God was going to do for Joseph. But Zebulun and Issachar were told to rejoice because there would be a reason for them to rejoice. You know, uh, in the old dictionary, the word rejoice, they take the the word in, in the 1828, the Noah Webster's Dictionary, a lot of you have it, and it's an amazing dictionary because, you know, a, a lot of preachers, the only thing they know is to run to the Greek and the Hebrew, and then they're grabbing somebody's book, and they're just picking a definition that suits them. But when you go into the English dictionary, you know, the old English dictionary, often it will give a scripture reference for the word. And if it's got a list of nine references, it'll attach the right verse to the right definition. In this definition, it gives the language trail 
that the word came into our language, the word rejoice. And they take you through the French and the Armenian and the Spanish and the Portuguese and the Danish and the German, just bring you all the way through. And that word comes from the thought to enjoy. But the primary meaning of the word is to shout. In other words, it's to be so glad that it's hard to contain it. That's what the word rejoice means. Um, to be so glad that it's hard to contain. Do you remember when last time was that you were that glad? Um, it means to be animated and excited. It means to literally be exhilarated with lively sensations. It's not just joy or gladness. Joy or gladness, those were great words. But it means joy and gladness to a high degree. In other words, you're, when you hit rejoicing, you're actually moving off the chart. It's so glad that it's hard to keep in and it causes a joyful shout. And the Lord says to Zebulun and Isaacar that they would rejoice. In verse 18, it says, and of Zebulun, he said, rejoice, Zebulun, in thy going out. And there's, there's two thoughts. He, he gives some reasons why Zebulun's going to rejoice and he gives some reasons why Isaacar is going to rejoice. He actually connects the two of them. Zebulun would rejoice in his going out. And there's two thoughts that show up in the Bible with Zebulun and his going out. Uh, one of those is the thought, believe it or not, of going out to war. And that's found in Judges chapter 4. Look there with me. So keep your, if you got a piece of paper or something you can stick in Deuteronomy 33 and go to Joshua and then Judges chapter 4. Thy going out. You, you guys know that Israel uh, in these early days, that much of their existence, uh, they were getting ready to go into Canaan land. And man, it would be all out war, uh, literally for at least five years. Uh, you guys know the story of Israel throughout the Old Testament. I mean, you've got you've got Samuel and you've got David, David, a great warrior. David told that he would not be allowed to build the temple, not because he was being uh, punished, uh, because he fought the Lord's battles. But the Lord said, uh, David, I'm going to let your son build it because you've shed a lot of blood. He said, your son Solomon will be a man of peace. I'm going to let him build it. But you just see that all through there. And um, Judges chapter 4, and look at verse 1. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord when Ehud was dead. Ehud was their judge, their leader at that time. And the Lord sold them into the hand of Jabin, king of Canaan, that reigned in Hazor, the captain of whose host was Sisera, which dwelt in Herosheth of the Gentiles. And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, for he had 900 chariots of iron. And 20 years he mightily oppressed the children of Israel. And Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth, she judged Israel at that time. And she dwelt under the palm tree of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in Mount Ephraim. And the children of Israel came up to her for to judgment. And she sent and called Barak, the son of Abinoam, out of Kadesh Naphtali and said unto him, Hath not the Lord God of Israel commanded, saying, Go and draw toward Mount Tabor and take with thee 10,000 men of the children of Naphtali and of the children of Zebulun? Look at verse 10. And Barak called Zebulun and Naphtali to Kadesh and he went up with 10,000 men at his feet, and Deborah went up with him. What you have to remember here is, is even with 10,000 men, they were horribly outnumbered. Verse 14, And Deborah said unto Barak, Up, for this is the day in which the Lord hath delivered Sisera into thine hand. Is not the Lord gone out before thee? So Barak went down from Mount Tabor and 10,000 men after him, and the Lord discomfited Sisera, in other words, the Lord just unhinged their army. And the Lord discomfited Sisera and all his chariots and all his hosts with the edge of the sword before Barak, so that Sisera lighted down off his chariot and fled away on his feet. But Barak pursued after, after the chariots and after the host, 
unto Erosheth of the Gentiles and all the host of Sisera fell upon the edge of the sword and there was not a man left. And in Judges chapter 5, it opens up with one of those songs in Scripture that the children of Israel being victorious and seeing the hand of God that had so moved on their behalf and had rescued them from 20 years of oppression. I, I guess it's time to sing after the curse lifts after 20 years. It's time to sing. It had been a long time since they'd sang. And in chapter 5, verse 1, it says, Then sang Deborah and Barak, the son of Abinoam, on that day, saying, Praise ye the Lord for the avenging of Israel when the people willingly offered, offered themselves. And then she goes on down through this song, and you hit verse 18. Zebulun and Naphtali were a people that jeoparded their lives into the death in the high places of the field. Boy, in this battle, Zebulun figured largely in the winning of this battle. Look at 1 Chronicles 12. If you go to your right, you'll see, you know, 1 and 2 Samuel, 1 and 2 Kings, and then you'll hit 1 Chronicles. Look at 1 Chronicles 12, and Zebulun shows up again in battle. First Chronicles 12. So you see that the Lord blesses Zebulun in Deuteronomy and the Lord's looking ahead to his going out. And God said, you know what? There's going to be great days of rejoicing in Israel when they're going to rejoice off the chart. And God said, Zebulun, you're going to rejoice with them. Rejoice. Look at First Chronicles 12, verse 23. First Chronicles 12, verse 23. And these are the numbers of the bands that were ready armed to the war and came to David, to Hebron, to turn the kingdom of Saul to him, according to the word of the Lord. And so he begins to go down and list different things about the tribes. And you come down to verse 33. And this is the mention of Zebulun. Of Zebulun, such as, and the wording is interesting, went forth. God says, Zebulun, blessed be your going out. Rejoice in your going out. Of Zebulun, such as went forth to battle, expert in war, with all instruments of war, 50,000, which could keep rank. They were not of double heart. They were a bunch of fighting machines, and they were a unit, and they were, they were a dangerous group to be reckoned with. And why was that? Well, in part because God said, Zebulun, you got battles ahead. Israel has battles ahead. And I'm going to let you help win them. Rejoice. There's a second thought, though, about Zebulun in his goings out. And that's found in Genesis 49. Genesis, first book in your Bible, Genesis 49. And when we look at this verse, hold your finger there for just a minute in Genesis 49. Genesis 49. And here you see Jacob as he blesses his 12 sons, which would be the 12 tribes. But he blesses directly his sons on this day as he's about to die. And look at Genesis 49, verse 13. Zebulun shall dwell at the haven of the sea. And he shall be for an haven of ships. And his border shall be unto Zidon. And that actually shows up later in the scripture, and we'll look at that in a little bit. Zebulun would be blessed in his going out. Well, first of all, he would be blessed in going out to war. But he would also go out to the sea. To the sea. Zebulun would be a group of merchants. And they would have ships. And they would be one of those groups that would go out and go around the world back in those days. And they would bring in their things from all over the world, those special things that they were so important to them at that time. Zebulun would go out to the sea. They would be involved in trade and in buying and selling. And the Lord said, Zebulun, rejoice in that going out. 
But Isaac would rejoice, the Bible says, in his tents. Isaac business would be at home. Zebulun's business would be all over the world. Zebulun would be the world travelers. But Isaac business would be at home. Isaac business would be his farm and his land. You're still there in Genesis 49. And look at verse 14. Genesis 49, verse 14. It says, Isaac is a strong ass couching down between two burdens. And he saw that rest was good and the land that it was pleasant. And he bowed his shoulder to bear and became a servant unto tribute. He saw that rest was good and the land that it was pleasant. Isaac would rejoice in his tents. You know, the hand of God puts different folks in different places. You know, God puts some people in the city and uh, some people are in the country and some people are in the seaports and some people are in the islands. And the hand of God directs different people to different jobs and occupations. Um, you go through the Bible and, man, you just see, just see everything under the sun. You see... Uh, Jacob, and he was a plain man, and he dwelt at home. And Esau was a hunter. And you see Paul and Priscilla and Aquila, and they were tent makers. You see centurions. You see people that worked, believers that worked in Caesar's household. You see Paul's shipmaster. You see magistrates. You see Luke, the, the beloved physician. You see Zenus, the lawyer. You see the apostles who were fishermen, many of them. You see the Ethiopian eunuch who was a, a big shot. He was a treasurer for the queen of Ethiopia. You see Amos the herdman. And you see, you know, our Lord born in Bethlehem. And, and, and where is he born? He's born where the shepherds are. Man, the, the hand of God ultimately, you know, he, he gives gifts people differently. And he gives people different inclinations. And, and um and you know, with our Lord, really, as a believer, as a believer, the only stipulation is that it be lawful gain, not unlawful gain. Uh, the Bible says a false balance is abomination to the Lord. That thought occurs two or three times. You know, the, the balance was the symbol of trade, you know, that the scale. And and the Lord said a false balance is, is, is an abomination to him. You know, the only real stipulation that our Lord had uh, the Lord never expected everybody and their brother to go down the same rail. He didn't expect everybody to do the same thing. You know how we are. We, uh, you know, we we sort of, um, we have ideas and we have thoughts and we have different way we view things, you know, and we tend to ele elevate certain people, you know, and and we tend to look at people, you know, by their by their uh, financial strata, you know, and well, this this guy makes a lot of money and this this gal, she makes money. And well, you know, these guys, you know, they're just, they're just, you know, they're they're down here somewhere. But you know that in the big scheme of things, you're going to find out one day that the will of God was the will of God for his people. And he just puts his people everywhere. Do you know why that is? Because he wants them to reach people everywhere. And he's got to have his people everywhere. At every place and in every strata. You got to read Romans 16. Man, there's a lot of great people that go on the eternal record. And very few of them were people that had a big name or a, or a high paying job. They just, they just got saved and they did what they could where they were for the rest of their life. Look at 1 Corinthians 7 for just a moment. 1 Corinthians 7. That's why the Lord said, don't be a respecter of persons. It's, it's really easy to... Um, you know, you know, there are positions that are honorable and God says, render honor to whom honor is due. But but you know what? Um, you know, it, it doesn't matter if 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 a if a, a lawyer walks in and 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 he's making six figures and he's a believer and he loves the Lord. Um, you shouldn't treat him any different. Then, then the guy that comes in and he's a he's he's just an apprentice in a construction trade. 
You know, there, there, there shouldn't be any difference. Uh, God said there should be no respect of persons. You know why that is? Is because God, God has a place for his people. And he places his people everywhere. In every place. And it's all honorable as far as God is concerned. If that's the place God puts you, then that's where you need to be. Now, and But we're going to look at a verse here. Let's look at it. 1 Corinthians 7. 1 Corinthians, um, 1 Corinthians 7, verse 21. And the Apostle Paul says something here. Art thou called being a servant? You know what a servant was? A servant was pretty low on the totem pole. I mean, somebody else owned you. Okay. Art thou called being a servant? The Lord said, care not for it. In other words, the Lord says, don't, don't be worried about it that you're, you're a servant. Don't, don't feel like there's a conflict of interest there. And notice what he says in the next phrase. Art thou called being a servant? Care not for it. But if thou mayest be made free, use it rather. The Lord says, if, if you can, you know, you know what that one centurion said to, uh, said to Paul? Paul said, you're about to beat me. And he said, uh, he said, I know I'm a Jew, but he said, but I'm a Roman citizen. And the centurion backed right off. And then the centurion said, I'm a citizen too. But he said, but with a great sum, I obtained my freedom. You know, in those days, um, you know, not everybody was the same on the scale. Just and, um, and here's what he said. He said, are you a servant? He said, that's okay. He said, do what you can where you are. He said, if you can be made free. In other words, if you can advance. He said, go for it. But he said, but use it for the Lord. Use it for the Lord. You know, some men and some women gravitate towards books and study. Some people gravitate toward the sea and travel. Some people to military service. Some people towards a farm. Some people towards sales, some people towards mechanics, and some people towards construction. And that is a good thing. You know what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 12? And, and I understand he's talking about spiritual gifts, but here's what he said. He said, for if the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? Where were the, if everybody did the same thing, if everybody in here did, if everybody in the city of Edmonton did construction, you know, that'd be nice until your vehicle broke down. You know? And then, then there'd be no mechanics. You know, and God's got a job for everybody. And the Lord said, rejoice, Zebulun, in thy going out, and Issachar in thy tents. A man of long ago said this. He said, let Zebulun rejoice in his going out. Let him thank God for his gains and make the best of the losses and inconvenience of his merchandise and not despise the quietness or the simpleness of Isaacar's tents. Let Isaacar rejoice in his tents. Let him be well pleased with the retirement and the peacefulness of his tents and the small profits of his country place, and not grudge that Zebulun's pleasure is in traveling and trading. Every business, this guy said long ago, and you think about this, every business has its conveniences and inconveniences. And it is really a great happiness if we can rejoice in our lot. This is the gift of God. Look at Ecclesiastes 5 for a moment. Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. Rejoice, Zebulun. You're going, to be, you're going to be in battle and you're going to be in ships. And Isaac Carr, you're going to be farming. He said, uh, he said, but I'm going to bless you both so that you can rejoice where you are. What a blessing when you can rejoice where you are. You know, so many people and so many Christians even, you know, they're, you know what, they're, they're, they're doing okay. But, you know, if you, you could see their heart, you know, they just somehow, how many of us, you know, have, have wished, that somehow our lot were different. And you know, the problem with that is, is um, man, you're not, you're not going to rejoice there. What a blessing it is 
Uh, what if, and how, how rare it is, can we say, where someone can walk into their house and see their car and see their stuff and look up towards heaven and say, God, I may never have another thing. I may be stuck here the rest of my life. But God, I just look around. I see your blessing everywhere. God, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for what you've done in my life and in my world. What a blessing it could be if God gave you the ability. You know, we can preach, you know, you can put people in guilt trips and you guys ought to be thankful. And, you know, look at that person over across the sea. You know, the joke is, you know, you're, you're feeding your kids peas and, and, you know, they're struggling to get it down. They're gagging. And, and you say the kids overseas are starving and the kids thinking, yeah, just send it overseas. <laughs> send it overseas. You know, uh, you can tell people to rejoice. You can make all those comparisons. And you know what? They are correct. They are correct. We are blessed here in North America. But even as I say the words, there's people that brings no comfort to. You know, uh, they still want more. They still wish it was different. And, you know, all the preaching in the world to, to really put the heat under them and get them to thank God, they may dutifully and intellectually go, yeah, I really should be thankful. Thank you, Lord. But you know what? This thing of being able to rejoice, God says, Zebulun and Isaacar, I've got a gift for you. He says, I'm going to put it in your heart that you can rejoice in your lot in life. When God puts that in your heart, man, you can walk in your door and you can sing and you can praise his name and you'll see the good and you'll you'll thank him from your heart. Look at Ecclesiastes 5 verse 18. Solomon, the great wise man said here in Ecclesiastes 5 Solomon said, Behold that, verse 18, behold that which I have seen. It is good and comely. Comely means beautiful, attractive. It is good and comely for one to eat and to drink and to enjoy the good of all his labor that he taketh unto the sun. You know what? We're, we're going to read the rest of this first minute, but you know what God said in another place? He said, The abundance of the rich will not suffer him to sleep. You know, there's some people, all their stuff that they have, it, it actually robs them of joy. Isn't that the wildest thing? But isn't that the truth? You know, let's read these verses. Let's read this verse again. Verse 18, it is good and comely for one. It is good and comely. It's a beautiful thing for one to eat and to drink and to enjoy the good of all his labor that he taketh under the sun all the days of his life, which God giveth him. For it is his portion. Every man also to whom God hath given riches and wealth and hath given, now watch, and hath given him power to eat thereof and to take his portion and to rejoice. There's the word. And to rejoice in his labor. This is the gift. Of God. I don't know. You know, maybe it'd be, you know, God is good and every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights. And you know, maybe, maybe one of the gifts you could ask God for, maybe one of the blessings we could ask God for is that He would give us the ability to see what we have instead of what we don't have and to rejoice. I mean, to where we'd actually. We find it hard to contain. It would so dawn on us what we have that we would rejoice. It says this is, you know what? He didn't, he didn't tell any of those other tribes to rejoice, but he said, Zebulun and Isaac, he said, I got a blessing for you. He said, I'm going to let you rejoice. Rejoice. You know what revival in the church is all about? David said this. He said, Wilt thou not revive thy people again that thy people may rejoice in thee? Rejoice. You say, Well, people got revived, they'd read their Bible more. Yep, yeah, they would. Well, if people got revived, they'd pray more. Yep, yeah, they would. But you know that the Lord doesn't revive us 
so that, that we can finally do all the list of duties we're supposed to do. That's not really what he has in mind. We're supposed to do those things. But David said, Lord, if you revive us, he said, our joy will become something that becomes hard to contain. I'm up for that, aren't you? That'd be a good thing to pray. And David, in that verse, he's praying. He said, Lord, wilt thou not revive us again? He said, oh, Lord God. He said, if you'll do that, he said, we'll rejoice. That'd be a good prayer this morning, wouldn't it? God, would you give me this blessing? Lord, I got a lot of blessings, and I know I do. But, Lord, obviously, I'm missing this one. Lord, would you give me this one? Look at their blessing in Deuteronomy 33, and there's a second part to the blessing in Deuteronomy 33. Deuteronomy 33. Deuteronomy 33, verse 18. And of Zebulun, he said, Rejoice, Zebulun, in thy going out, and Isaacar in thy tents. They, now he, now he takes both of them together. He said, there's a second part to the blessing. He said, not only am I, am I going to bless you so greatly that you'll find it hard to keep it in. He said, they shall call the people unto the mountain. There they shall offer sacrifices of righteousness. They shall call the people unto the mountain. There they shall offer sacrifices of righteousness. The second part of this blessing is this, that Zebulun and Issachar would be both used of God and they would call the people unto the mountain. And that is a prophecy about the temple. At that time in Israel, you know, the temple had not been built. The temple was, you know, this beautiful, wonderful building that Solomon would build many, 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 many years later. For now, they were still worshiping in the tabernacle, which is that big tent that traveled with them in the wilderness. And that was the center. That was the, the place of sacrifice and offering. But Moses, by the Holy Ghost here, speaks prophetically. And he says, God, he says, I want you to use... Zebulun, the Holy Ghost says, they shall call the people to the mountain. Look at Psalm 48, Psalm 48. They would both be used of God. And boy, isn't that interesting. The first thing that comes is the ability to rejoice. And then comes usefulness. When the Lord turned again the captivity of Zion... We were like them that sing. Our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with singing. Then said they among the heathen, the Lord hath done great things for them. Boy, when they started to the rejoice, suddenly it caught the attention of the heathen. You know what caught the attention of the heathen? Suddenly something was happening they didn't have. You know what they didn't know? They all had stuff, but nobody had rejoicing. And God says, first, Zebulun and Isaacar, he said, I'm going to put something inside of you that will make your heart sing. In your, in your lot in life, I'm going to give you the ability to rejoice. And then secondly, the next thing that's going to spring out of that is, I'm going to use both of you for the glory of God. They shall call the people to the mountain. Look at Psalm 48. Psalm 48, verse 1. Great is the Lord. And greatly to be praised in the city of our God, in the mountain of his holiness. Beautiful for situation. The joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the city of the great king. Well, that mountain. And that mountain, it was called Mount Zion. And that was the place of Jerusalem. And that was the place where the temple would be built. Uh, go to 2 Samuel chapter 5. 2 Samuel chapter 5. Look at 
He said, Zebulun, he said, you and you and Isaac are, he said, uh, you know, I'm going to need some people to, to help help a bunch of other people get to the right place. He said, I'm going to give you the privilege. He said, you'll call the people to the mountain. Look at 2 Samuel 5, verse 6. Ah, 2 Samuel 5, verse 4. And David was 30 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 40 years. In Hebron, he reigned over Judah seven years and six months. And in Jerusalem, he reigned 30 and three years over all Israel and, Jews and, and Judah. And the king and his men went to Jerusalem. So, now, so it tells you he's been in Hebron. He hasn't arrived in Jerusalem yet, but all of a sudden in verse 6, he's hitting Jerusalem. And the king and his men went to Jerusalem unto the Jebusites, the inhabitants of the land. A lot of you guys remember the Jebusites. That was one of those nations that was supposed to be conquered, and they were never driven out. He went to Jerusalem unto the Jebusites, the inhabitants of the land, which spake unto David, saying, Except thou take away the blind in the lane, thou shalt not come in hither, thinking David cannot come in hither. <laughs> Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion. The same is the city of David. Uh, Zion. You know, there, there's no doubt in anybody's mind, if anybody reads the Bible, what, what Zion was and is. It is the city of the great king. Beautiful for situation. The joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion. Look at Isaiah chapter 2. He said, Zebulun and Naphtali. He said, I, I, I'm going to give you guys the privilege he said, you will call people to the mountain. Look at Isaiah chapter 2, verse 1. The word that Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. Now, you know, no guesswork about who that is. And um, um, in, in this passage, if uh, there's no way you can make it mean something other than what it means unless you're just absolutely forcibly, absolutely deliberately saying, I can't let this mean what it says. So we don't do that here. We believe what it says. And so that, let's look at what it says, okay? Um, he saw this vision concerning Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall come to pass in the last days. Okay, so he's not talking about 50 years away in some battle somewhere. It shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow unto it and many people shall go and say, Zebulun and Naphtali, they're in on this one. Zebulun and Isaac are. Come ye, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion, this is yet way future, out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. You know what? Zebulun and Isaac were going to be used of God in their various lot in life. Man, I don't know where you're at this morning. I don't know what your lot is. And if you're young, you know, and you're in your 20s and 30s, you know, you're sometimes, you know, people are still trying to figure that out. And and but, you know, you reach a certain point in life and and, you know, you your, your lot is pretty much established. You know, you're you're probably going to be in this province or in this town. You know, you there's 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 your lot in life. You know what God God wants to do? He wants to use you in your lot in life. And Zebulun and Isaac Hart were going to be used of God. And this was a blessing that God gave them. And they would call others to the place where God would be found. Where God would meet with his people. Where God would be real. Where God would be served and honored. They would call them to that place. You know what? I'm not saying this is bad. Not at all. I don't know. Maybe some of you called somebody this past week and said, come on over. We're going to watch the Oilers win or lose or something. You know, I, I don't know. Maybe maybe you called somebody to your house, you know, to, you know, to help you fix something. Or maybe you called them, you know, to uh, to go to the mall with you. And you know what? There's nothing wrong with those things. But 
But um, wouldn't it be wonderful? Wouldn't it be wonderful if God put it in your heart to start calling people to a higher place, to the place where he is? Do you ever hear that whisper in your heart where the Lord says, you know, you know, you could you could talk for me. You know, you know, you could you could go visit so and so and you could uh, you could try to get him to come up higher. Look at Zechariah. If you go to the book of Malachi, that's the last book in the Old Testament. And you just back up a page or two and you'll hit Zechariah. Go to Zechariah chapter 8. You know, the Lord wants to bless you in your lot in life. But the Lord wants to use you in your lot in life. There's people nearby you. You got friends, you got relatives, you got co-workers. And you know what? Nobody's going to call them to the mountain but you. God says, I'll, I'll help you. Look at Zechariah 8, verse 18. Zechariah 8, verse 18. And the word of the Lord of hosts came unto me, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the fast of the fourth month and the fast of the fifth and the fast of the seventh and the fast of the tenth shall be to the house of Judah joy and gladness and cheerful feasts. Therefore, you, you read what you understand what he just said there. He said, I'm going to turn your fast into a feast. He said before, historically, he said all those times were times of grief and mourning because you were seeking me. God says, I, I'm going to bring you to a place where you'll never need to do that again. And God says, I'm going to take those same days on the calendar. And he says, I'm going to turn those into days when you will praise my name. And you'll, it'll, be, it'll be gladness in your heart. Notice in verse 18, joy and gladness and cheerful feast. Therefore, love the truth and peace. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, it shall yet come to pass that there shall come people and the inhabitants of many cities and the inhabitants of one city shall go to another saying, let us go speedily to pray before the Lord and to seek the Lord of hosts. I will go also. Yea, many people and strong nations shall come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem and to pray before the Lord. Thus saith the Lord of hosts in those days, it shall come to pass that 10 men shall take hold out of all languages of the nations, even shall take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew saying, we will go with you. We have heard that God is with you. God said, there's a day coming. And he said, there'll be a call that goes out. Come with us to the mountain. And God said, there's going to be a whole whack of people that jump on board because they know God is with them. What a privilege, Zebulun. What a privilege. What a, what a blessing. It would outlive time. You know, your, your job and your fortune, and let's say you're blessed financially and you leave your kids, you know, $100,000 each, you know, and a piece of ground, that would be wonderful, and it would be. But you know what? Um, that, that only exists in time. And time comes to an end. In Psalm 90, it says, man's days are three score and 10. And if by reason of strength, they be four score years, that's 80. Yet is their strength, labor, and sorrow. God says, you know, there, there reached a point in history, you know, in those early books of the Bible, there was longevity and there were reasons for that. But suddenly that came to an end. And God said, as far back as the book of Psalms, that man's lifespan, by and large, your allotted days are 70. And if you live beyond that, you're living on a bonus. You know, there's a lot of things you could do and have and a lot of places you could go and and all that, and that's all wonder, and there's great things, and God blesses us with earthly things that we can enjoy. He does that. But you know what? There's got to be something that we do that outlives time, because otherwise, everything we've done goes into the dirt when we do. But God says, Zebulun and Naphtali, you know, you're, Zebulun, you're, you're, I'm going to bless you. You're going you're gonna to enjoy your ships, and you're going to win your battles. I, I, you're, it's going to be great. And he says, and Isaac, are, he says, I'm going to bless your farms. I'm going to bless your land. It's going to be great. And, and we're not, we don't have time to go there. But the last, the last phrase of that blessing is God says, I'm going to make you rich. That's what he told him. 
He says, you'll suck the abundance of the seas and the treasures out of the sand. Oh, we know what treasure out of the sand is. We drove by this morning and saw the price of some of that treasure at the gas stations. <laughs> we saw it. Um, you know what God said? God said, boy, do I, got a, do I got a gift for you. But God says, but while I'm blessing you, let me give you something that will outlive time. God says, if you can call some people to the mountain, God says, I'll give you something that will last forever. There'll be people you'll meet on the other side and they'll hug your neck someday. You guys are, you know, some of you put money in missions, you know, and you never see that money. The Boy, that, that's an act of faith. You give that money and we send it to the, the Holtz and we send it to Brother Holes and we send it to the Rays and, and we give it to the Weebs and, you know, we give it to various people, you know, and, and you know, you don't see, and you know what happens with that money? They're printing tracts, they're printing Bibles, they're buying gas to go out and they're preaching the gospel. And you know what they're doing? They're calling people to the mountain. And you know what? You're, you may live and die and you may not see a whole lot happen. You will see something happen because uh, unless you die right away, because in due season, you shall reap. If you faint not, you keep sowing that seed. He that goeth forth and weepeth bearing precious seed shall doubtless come again with rejoicing. You do the work of the Lord. You start speaking up for him and you're going to see some fruit on this side. But you know what? The blessing is when we help other people, you know what you're doing? You're, it, it starts getting multiplied. And all of a sudden, one day you're in heaven. And this guy comes up to you from Sierra Leone with his family. And says, you don't know me. But you're from Capital City Baptist Church, aren't you? You remember several times you, you gave money for the Holtz. Do you remember that? And you go, yeah, I remember. And the, and the guy from Sierra Leone says, because you did that. Me and my wife and my kids were here today. And they're going to hug your neck. You know what? All the stuff we had, it goes, it's gone when we die. But you know what? The stuff we, we called people to the mountain, that outlives time. You know what Paul said to the Philippians? He said, are not ye, he said to the Philippians, because Paul had told them of Jesus. He said, are not ye my joy and crown of rejoicing at the appearing of Jesus Christ? He says, I, I'm not going to get paid for that now. But he said, but he said, I'm going to have a crown. And he says, it's because because I got to help you guys. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. And you see a little hint of this being fulfilled in Matthew 4. We're about done. You don't have to turn there. But all of a sudden, Jesus shows up on the scene. And right before he starts preaching, he shows up on the seashore at Zidon, and the Bible says in Matthew 4, in the land of Zebulun, and it says the people that sat in darkness saw a great light. <laughs> Zebulun was just getting started. And God says, you know what? I'm going to shine my light, but I'm going to start. He says, I, I promised Zebulun that it would start there. And Christ shines out of Zebulun. Christian, what a blessing. What a blessing that we can call some people to the mountain. And boy, you know, the, the greatest mountain of time and eternity. You know what it was? It was a place called Mount Moriah. And on Mount Moriah, God spoke to Abraham, said, Abraham, take now thy son, thine only son, and offer him for a burnt sacrifice. And he goes up to that mountain, and, and Isaac doesn't know what's going on. And, and finally, Isaac says, uh, Dad, uh, here's the fire and here's the wood. Where's the lamb? And, and Abraham, not knowing what he said, said, God will provide himself a lamb. And he gets up on that hill and he's about to sacrifice his only son, the picture of what God did. And he said, suddenly an angel stopped him. And he said, there is a ram and a substitute died for Isaac. You say, preacher, I thought Calvary was the greatest hill. It is. And you know where Calvary was located? Calvary is Mount Moriah. Oh, Abraham offered his only son. And a few thousand years later, God offered his. And the focal point of all eternity 
the dead from the ancient past and the dead of all time in the future. You know what? Their destiny hinged on that mountain. And you know what we do as Christians? We're just calling people to the mountain. We're saying, Christ died for you. What must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. I closed with this. Not long ago, uh, I met a guy and, and he was telling about people that he had witnessed to. And, and he had this school teacher that came to his church. Don't close your Bibles. Don't sit tight. Don't get restless. And he said, uh, he said, before I was a pastor, he said, I was a school teacher. And so his manner was very school teacherish, but he was, he's really easy to listen to. Really good, really great guy. And he said, I got preaching. He says, I, I pastored a fairly large church. And he said, there was this guy that was bringing this little old lady to church. And he said, I went up one day to greet him. And I said, hey, man, he said, uh, thank you so much for coming. I'm, I'm glad you bring this to so-and-so. And he said, Do, are, are you a Christian? He said, oh, no. He said, I don't believe any of that stuff. He said, I, he said, I don't even believe in God. He said, I just, I just bring, you know, granny so-and-so, you know, just she was a friend of the family and she wants us to, her family wanted me to bring her to church. So I just bring her. And he said, well, great, great. And he said, uh, he said, well, I'm a pastor so-and-so. He said, I used to be a school teacher. And the other guy goes, oh, yeah. He said, I figured. He said, he said, I was a school teacher too. He said, I can sort of tell by the way you, you, you taught. He said, I thought this guy's a school teacher. Well, they, they sort of hit it off, you know, and, and they became friends and they would chat every once in a while. And, and so he started, he started going to the guy and saying, you know, we'll call him Frank. He said, Frank. He said, uh, has anybody ever sat down with you and told you from the Bible about what Jesus did for you? And he said, preacher, no, but you know, don't waste your time. He said, I, I don't believe in that stuff. He said, I like you. But he said, but I don't believe any of this stuff. He said, I'm just here for granny so-and-so. So this, this scene would play itself out once in a while. And finally one day, and then one day he said, he said, well, pastor, the pastor asked him again. The pastor was persistent. And he said, well, pastor, you know what? I really don't want to hear it. But he said, if I was going to hear it, he said, I'd want to listen to you tell it. But he said, but I'm still not interested. He said, okay, okay. Well, one day he was out in Frank's neck of the woods. And uh, he called Frank. He said, Frank, he said, I'm going to be out in your neck of the woods there. He said, uh, how about I take you out for coffee? And uh, would you would you let me, would you let me just, just once tell you what Jesus did for you? And he said, okay, Brother John. He said, just this once. He said, I got one hour and I'm out of there. He said, I got an appointment. But he said, he said, for you, I'll do this. So he said, okay. So they met and he said, he, they started talking. He said, I took him through the Bible. And he said, you know what he did? He called him to the mountain. He told him about Jesus, how he's born of a virgin, how he lived that life, how he died on the cross, how he took our sins in his own body, how he rose from the dead. And how he offered a salvation to anybody that would take it. And he said, I got all done. And he said, I closed my little Bible and I just sat there. And Frank said, so um, what am I supposed to do? He said, what do you mean what are you supposed to do? Frank said, well, I can't just sit here and listen to this and not do something about it. And he said, Frank, I thought you said you didn't believe in God. He said, I don't. But he said, but I believe this. I got to do something about this. Frank bowed his head. And he got saved and he got saved. You know what happened? Just one person said, Frank, there's a mountain here. It's way up here. It's high, but it's beautiful. Could I, could I bring you to the mountain? What a difference that mountain's made in your life. You know what the Lord wants us to do? He wants to call some more people to the mountain. Let's pray. What a privilege, Christian. You don't need to be embarrassed. You don't need to be afraid. It'd be wonderful. Maybe today, maybe tomorrow, you could just take just a couple minutes and say, could I tell you about Jesus? You say, it'll feel so awkward. Oh, yeah, it will. But, but you know what you're doing? You're doing what God said would be the greatest blessing he could give you. You could call somebody to the mountain. Would you do it this week? Would you do it? Would you try? God says, I'll give you joy that you can't contain. If you'll call somebody to the mountain. Father, thank you for the truth. Lord, thank you for that mountain, Lord. Oh, Lord. 
how much you loved us. That you gave your only son. God, help us now this morning. There may be some that do not know thee this morning. Oh, God, would you help them, Lord? And Lord, would you help the rest of us? That we would be able to rejoice in our lot in life. And Lord, that also in our rejoicing, Lord, we would be used of thee. Lord, that somehow you'd put that in our hearts. In Jesus' name. With your heads bowed, if God has spoken to you this morning, why don't you talk to the Lord right there where you sit? He'll know exactly what you're trying to say. Just tell him, say, Lord Jesus, I believe you're everything. I believe you died for me. Lord, would you take my sins away? What must I do to be saved? It's so simple. Believe on the Lord Jesus. It's just so simple. Just tell him, say, Lord Jesus, I believe. I believe it all, Lord Jesus. Christian, you got a blessing you need to ask for today? Like that man said, I can't just listen to this and not do something about it. Jesus is nearby. He's, he's hoping you'll do something about it. Lord, thank you for your book and thank you for the truth. And Lord, we just pray that you'd bless it to every heart this day. In Jesus' name, amen. You're dismissed. <laughs>